All right, I think we are good to go. Um, so um, welcome everyone to our Digital Assets Update 3Q24 webinar. So um, with me today, um, we have uh, Samuel, who is, um, um, will be covering ETA, uh, Nathan who will be covering CBDCs, and me, uh, Wilang, will be um, covering what's going on in the big Bitcoin markets. So I think that the webinar is coming at an opportune time where uh, we have a crypto meeting um, US politics where um, candidates on both sides have made uh, various proclaimments about how they intend to support crypto or how they're shifting towards a more receptive attitude, if you will, um, towards um, digital assets. Um, whether or not that would translate to actual regulatory changes, I think remains um, remains uh, uncertain, but we'll definitely be discussing um, some of the potential legal changes that could, ch that could happen post elections and what are the implications uh, for crypto. So beyond that, we'll also be commenting um, on the most recent crypto markets volatility. There have been, um, I would say, uh, fairly big uh, moves uh, across Bitcoin prices as well as Ether prices, and we will go deep into what are drivers behind these moves and how we see uh, how we see um, prices to evolve uh, going forward. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll move to our I will um, present to you our publications, which is which has uh, just been released today. Um, the digital assets um, quarterly publication, and that will be on the next slide. So if you scan the QR code over here, you will be able to get um, the link to um, our most recent update where you can download uh, the report and, um, and um, get, a, get a good uh, sense of what the major drivers in the crypto space. Um, so with that, we are going to presentation proper. I'll kick off with uh, our, our views on Bitcoin markets, uh, as well as what the latest US political developments are. Um, and it's quite obvious, um, Bitcoin has seen incredible volatility uh, since since June. Um, uh, firstly, there was a lot of excitement um, after the halving event back in April, but it didn't really translate into very significant uh, changes in uh, Bitcoin prices. It was more or less consolidating around levels between 60,000, 70,000, and then suddenly you have a very big uh, sharp uh, dislocation, if you will, um, in um, in June. Uh, the reason is because uh, we have news from Mao Gox, which was a defunct exchange based in Japan, uh, and that was basically bankrupt back in 2014 uh, because of an exchange hack. And um, 10 years later, uh, they're starting to repay uh, their creditors, so they are repaying about hundred forty thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, hundred forty thousand uh, uh, Bitcoins. Uh, and the interesting thing is that when the exchange went bankrupt, 20, 2014 Bitcoin prices was around five hundred dollars per coin. Uh, now they are trading at such high levels; it's very likely that um, the when the distribution happens to those creditors, you can get. Uh, a very high uh, proportion of them wanting to sell uh, simply because they got in a, such a low entry price and given where prices are, they're probably looking um, to deallocate to some extent. So in some ways, um, this is a bit of a supply shock to the Bitcoin markets. You could have potentially up to 140,000 coins hitting the market in a very short period of time. So Mao Gox uh, has started distribution in early July. Uh, it will uh, completely disperse all the coins by 31st October, which was a deadline that set for itself. So up to now, about 60% of coins have already been distributed. So we can see uh, there was a bit of a gap down um, in early June and late June uh, when that event happened. And subsequently, we see Bitcoin prices have been somewhat weighed down. Um, that's due to the fact that uh, we're still in a phase of distribution. There was also, um, News from the German government distributing coins that have confiscated, that's to a smaller extent than uh, Mao Gox, but that also could um, have to, to some extent affected sentiment quite negatively in Bitcoin markets. Um, the second major market mover for Bitcoin was really 
I would say, global uh, risk aversion. Uh, this was triggered um, back in July when Bank of Japan surprised markets with not just cutting down of its JGB purchases, um, but also raising rates um, again in a surprise rate high. So we see a very sharp volatility uh, led by an unwind of uh, yen based carry trades. Uh, we see uh, equity markets selling off and the VIX index actually soaring. So if you see this chart on the right, VIX actually sought to as high as 35.40 at one point, and that coincided with a second sell-off um, in the Bitcoin market. So Bitcoin is still pretty, pretty um, linked with uh, financial markets. It does suffer to some extent spillovers, contagion, if you will, um, from the movements in global financial markets. It shows how um, integrated it is uh, with uh, traditional financial asset markets, even though Bitcoin uh, has always been uh, considered as more uh, independent or rather more, uh, to some extent, decentralized and um, uh, is, is, is really a very um, uh, special market and so on. But in front of financial performance perspective, it's no different uh, from traditional financial assets. So let's take a closer look at what happened in the wake of the Mao Gox announcement. Um, so I think what's interesting uh, is whether or not Bitcoin markets have sufficient liquidity to handle uh, such a shock announcement and whether or not markets can respond rapidly uh, to this, uh, this, this sort of news that affect prices. Um, so we did an event study. Uh, we look at the um, trading day returns uh, for Bitcoin. In, uh, on the day of the announcement, as well as five subsequent days post-announcement, um, to see if there's any meaningful or significant um, uh, abnormal returns, if you will, uh, for Bitcoin. And rather interestingly, um, we noticed that, yes, Bitcoin uh, posted a large negative abnormal return on the first day of the announcement, uh, but it's also not very significantly different from what um, equities or stocks tend to do uh, in the wake of a season equity offering. Um, so for instance, um, researchers have looked at how uh, stock prices tend to do for uh, in the wake of uh, unexpected season equity offerings uh, during the pandemic period back in 2020. And they found that for large and mid cap stocks, the average return on a day is about minus 8.6%. So if you look at Bitcoin's um, daily and normal return on the day of the Malgox announcement, it's about minus 7.3%. It's smaller than what we see in equity markets. So it doesn't suggest um, that Bitcoin has a very exaggerated reaction. Uh, probably it, it reflects the fact that liquidity in the Bitcoin markets is actually quite ample. Uh, that's, um, that, that probably is one of the reasons why uh, the response is relatively muted. Uh, it's no bigger than what we see in the case of equities, uh, season equity offerings. Uh, what's more interesting is if you look at the subsequent days, and normal returns of Bitcoin for subsequent days, they are all insignificant. Uh, given the underlying uh, volatility of Bitcoin. Uh, so it shows that markets have been very fast in pricing the news. Uh, so the markets in for Bitcoin has really matured quite a, quite a fair bit. Not only is liquidity, liquidity fairly deep, uh, but also at the same time, uh, the, efficiency of, the efficiency of the market in terms of this reaction to news is very, very fast. Uh, so on the first day, uh, you see a sharp reaction and then subsequently, uh, there's not really much reaction. If you compare that with equities, uh, it's a slightly different story. So on the second day, uh, which is day one post announcement, you could still see um, a small uh, and normal return for, for stocks. So in this case, Bitcoin is even more efficient than equity markets in terms of pricing news. So the conclusion that we, we derive is that the response to sudden supply shocks in the case of Bitcoin is not at all different from traditional financial assets. It's very mature. Um, it's very much uh, the case that when you enter Bitcoin markets at any time, it's really a very efficient price that's already being offered uh, at that time. Um, the second aspect that we'd like to look at is how correlations of Bitcoin have changed uh, versus um, how they comp versus uh, that of uh, equities and versus that of gold. So if you look at the first table over here, um, crypto correlations with the S&P 500 is still very high. Uh, Bitcoin is about 
0.5, Ethereum is about 0.6. So very much Bitcoin, crypto, most crypto assets, they are still a risky asset. Bitcoin may be considered as digital gold uh, in some, to some extent uh, because supply is limited and considered as uh, kind of functional money. But in terms of this financial market um, characteristic, it's very different from gold. So it doesn't have very high correlation with gold. So when we saw the sell off back in uh, July due to the, the unwind and carry trades, um, we, it, it, it was to be expected uh, crypto actually uh, see a larger sell off than gold uh, simply because it has a higher beta to risk. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the five year cap and beta, um, and you could see that actually. Ether, Bitcoin, uh, they all have much higher beta than the average S&P 500 uh, index stock. Uh, their beta level is perhaps comparable with uh, tech stocks. So it's around uh, uh, around 1.8 for Bitcoin and above uh, 2.5 for, for Ether. So to some extent, uh, when there's huge risk aversion, uh, we would expect the equity risk factor uh, to dominate, we expect that to hit uh, crypto market sentiment uh, somewhat more than in equity space. Uh, the important point to note is that Ether is higher beta than Bitcoin, and therefore you have seen a larger sell-off to some extent. And now moving ahead to look at what developments are on the US political front. Um, we would say that there has been a bit of a difference um, in terms of the, um, the positioning of policy platforms. Uh, between the two presidential candidates. Uh, Harris, on the Democrat side, she has no plans to introduce a crypto policy platform, but she did signal that she wants reset with the crypto industry. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, that means that they are having conversations with uh, industry, crypto industry players. They want to build a constructive relationship uh, that will enable them to set a smart regulatory framework that would um, help the growth of the entire digital asset class. Uh, so to some extent, that is a bit of a softening attitude. So previously, uh, the Democrats have been more leaning towards um, uh, strong regulation, regulations of digital assets. Uh, we know um, that the SEC has prosecuted uh, many um, cryptocurrency firms. Uh, so definitely to some extent, uh, this marks a little bit of a shift. You could say it's because of elections, uh, but um, that's definitely a shift towards a more um, receptive attitude, if you will, towards digital assets. Uh, on the Republican side, Trump uh, has put himself out in terms of uh, showing very strident support for digital assets or cryptocurrencies. Uh, so back in the uh, Nashville uh, Bitcoin convention, he announced uh, that if um, uh, that, that he wants Bitcoin to be mined in the USA and stored in the USA. So he intends to create a strategic national Bitcoin pro, um, stockpile. Uh, what that means is that the government, the US government would keep tokens that it holds acquires. It would not be selling them. Um, to some extent, you could think of it as perhaps creating a strategic oil um, reserves back in the 70s. Uh, but to some extent, it could also be, uh, I guess, um, pandering a bit to um, the crypto uh, uh, to the crypto crowd from the point of view of creating a stockpile by not actively buying but actually holding on to as to, to, to whatever bitcoins that the government uh, possess through various means and not uh, and keeping it in reserve uh, for future purposes uh, he has also announced that he will be removing SEC head Yensler uh, if he becomes president so we know um, that the SEC has been very aggressive in terms of uh, regulations and so on and so forth. So uh, announcing a personal change, I think, does signify to some extent the Republicans' desire um, to ease off in terms of regulatory, um, in terms of regulatory uh, stance or attitude towards the crypto industry. Um, most notably, I think uh, Trump's uh, VP candidate, uh, Jenny Vance, is very pro-crypto. Uh, he's he's uh, he's known to have owned uh, to to have owned over one hundred thousand dollar worth of uh, Bitcoin, and uh, back when he was a senator, he was advocating a an industry friendly crypto bill. So to some extent, we could see um, that Republicans will lean more towards uh, supporting crypto than Democrats, um, at least from the uh, presidential candidates' high level policy perspective. 
Um, but also we would like to, to, to draw at some attention in terms of um, the what's ha also happening on the legislature front. Uh, so uh, some some months back, uh, the US Congress, the, the House of Representatives has passed this act, the Financial Innovation and Technology for 21st Century Act, uh, or abbreviated as FIT21. Uh, is, aim is to improve regulatory clarity for digital assets. Um, so under the, this, 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 um, this act, uh, they will designate uh, responsibility for regulation of uh, digital assets with functional decentralized blockchains to the CFTC as compared to the SEC. So to some extent, that will probably mean a relaxation of um, regulatory uh, scrutiny on uh, digital assets if that's to happen. Um, so far, that bill has not cleared Senate um, and partly the reason is because there's still a lot of opposition uh, among senators to, to some of the uh, um, provisions of the bill. Uh, and if you look at the, um, the division of Senate's, uh, senators um, by those who are pro-crypto versus anti-crypto, so we look at um, uh, that, that that classification done by a political lobby group called Stand with Crypto, and from their data, they 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 is they they show that overwhelmingly large proportion of pro crypto U.S. senators they are really Republicans. Uh, there are some Democrat senators, but by and large they are in the um, uh, minority. Uh, whereas if you look at anti crypto U.S. senators, by and large the vast majority is um, they are Democrats. So if there's a shift in the U.S. Senate uh, composition um, after elections, uh, then that could potentially have some implications to the likelihood of passage of this FIT21 uh, legislation. Uh, so if that's the case, we could potentially see uh, very significant regulatory changes uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, in the U.S. Uh, post-elections. Uh, so that could also mean, to some extent, um, sentiment towards digital assets could, sh could shift as well, depending on how uh, election outcomes uh, were to, were, 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 uh, are, are, are in, the, in the coming months in November. Um, so as a wrap up, um, I'll just quickly discuss um, the most uh, recent market cap numbers for Bitcoin Eater. We see that even though there's been a sell-off, uh, Bitcoin it's now hovering about 60,000 at its peak. It was, way, it was about 72,000. So even with that sell-off um, in Bitcoin prices and a very tremendous sell-off in Ether, the market cap of uh, the cryptocurrencies is still higher than where they were at the end of 2023. So that has been, uh, it, it doesn't, so that loss of momentum has not translated into a very significant loss in market cap. Uh, most investors, if they're bought, uh, in 23, they're still sitting on pretty solid gains. And if you look at the returns of uh, Bitcoin Eater, whether or not a year-to-date return, a uh, one-year horizon or five-year horizon, they are still well above uh, what the S&P 500 has provided, has even with a strong bull market, and they're also well above what um, go, uh, the returns for Go uh, have been. So it, it's very clearly a case um, that, that, um, that sentiments and also to some extent, uh, reception towards digital assets, reception towards cryptocurrencies, this have continued to grow um, over the last year or so, even though there has been some uh, volatility uh, in, in both Bitcoin and Ether markets. So with that, I'll pass on to Sam, who will cover developments in Ether. Okay. Um, thanks, Weilang. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in this section, I will briefly uh, walk through some updates on Ethereum, and then I will pass on to Nathan on the CPTC Central Bank Digital Currency Update. So next slide, please. Thank you. So um, first of all, Ethereum uh, retreated by over like forty percent since its peak in uh, of over four thousand uh, US dollar in mid March, falling to the trough of around like two thousand three hundred to two thousand four hundred in early August, and now is rebounded to around two thousand seven hundred as of I uh, last look at it before the webinar started. 
Um, so similar to the BTC and other uh, major asset classes, the recent ETF, uh, uh, ETH sell-off was largely a result of the unwinding, uh, winding uh, JPY carry trade and also of market consolidation in the major asset class and their spillover onto uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum as well. Uh, while the Ethereum has closely tracked it, uh, the Bitcoin trajectory, it's underperformed the BTC in the market downtrend. So if we look at the chart on the left-hand side here, the uh, ETH BTC retreated from recent peak of 0 0.056 in late June after the announcement of the um, ETF approval uh, to around like 0 0.045 as of uh, August, which is the lowest level last since uh, April in 2021. Um, so um, if we look at the performance of the uh, ETF, uh, recent launch the ETF as well, it looks quite unfavorable comparing to the ET uh, BTC ETF as well. So if we look at a chart on the right hand side here, um, the red line is the uh, fund uh, inflow into the uh, ETH ETF and the black line is the uh, fund inflow into BTC um, uh, ETF back in January. So here we compare the first uh, 21 trading days of um, of these two uh, ETFs. So uh, we can see that there is a net outflow of uh, 400 million, almost 400 million um, from the ETH, uh, uh, ETH ETF uh, versus uh, there is a 1.8 billion inflow uh, into the BTS, BTC ETF in the first three weeks since its launch in January. So uh, meanwhile, if we look at the overall uh, AUM, the Ethereum ETF AUM also fell by 25% to just uh, 7.5 uh, billion in the first three weeks post launch. So um, we see a um, quicker performance comparing to the uh, BTC in the market downtrend. So um, next slide, please. And then we will discuss why is that. So fight, uh, flight to quality is not a surprising development during a market correction. Like other traditional asset classes, such as like equities, bonds, prop even properties, uh, qualities asset with bigger market capitalization tends to outperform riskier asset in the risk-off environment. So uh, just a quick note, if, we, uh, if you have um, noticed in Wei Lang's chart, there is a chart on the market cap of BTC and ETH and other asset classes. So BTC market cap was like 1.2 trillion US dollar versus just 319 billion for Ethereum. So the liquidity is certainly better for BTC comparing to the Ethereum. And on the ETF front, the AUM of uh, ETF, ETF, Ethereum ETH is just like 13% of the uh, Bitcoin counterpart as of uh, 13th of August. Um, and if, even if we compare the uh, performance of the first three weeks since the launches of these two um, cryptocurrency ETFs, um, Ethereum was like just 30%, uh, the, e the AUM of Ethereum ETF is just 30% of the BTC counterpart. So therefore, we looked at the standard deviation of um, uh, Ethereum in the past five years is actually even higher than BTC. So if we look at the table down below that here, we can see that the analyzed standard deviation is really high for Ethereum, even comparing to BTC and not to mention compared to S&P 500. So this also matches with uh, Wei Lang's earlier analysis on the beta uh, in his presentation. So, uh, but moving forward, um, you know, even if the uh, traditional financial market conditions stabilize, uh, cryptocurrency may rebound accordingly as well. So in a risk-on environment, uh, on the contrary, uh, the relatively riskier Ethereum could bottom out in a stronger way. And if we look at the chart on the left-hand side here, the um, ETH BTC ratio, which is the red line, tends to rise during the risk on sentiment, for example, like 2021 and early 2024. So which means Ethereum could outperform uh, BTC during the market uptrend. So um, this, uh, so I mean, given all these, uh, uh, you know, market cap of, or, you know, size of the uh, asset class, the uh, rebound and also the rebound during uptrend or the uh, contraction or correction during the downtrend could be much more volatile for a smaller SS class like uh, ET, uh, Ethereum. So what next? What next for uh, Ethereum? Maybe we can go to the next slide, please. So now, 
uh, re retail in, and international institutional investors can easily assess Ethereum with traditional financial network through the ETF. Uh, the next hurdle for the um, uh, for the ETF to gain further traction in is the regulatory restriction on sticking via the ETF. So uh, to recap. Uh, proof of stake or sticking is is the way to prove the validator to have put something of value into the network that can uh, be destroyed if they act dishonestly. So this could um, help enhance the economic security of the Ethereum network. So uh, with this sticking uh, mechanism, the um, uh, the the user can you know deposit thirty two Ethereum into um, uh, into a smart contract, and then it, that can yield some sort of return, which could be around like three to eight percent annually, depends on the network condition. And here we have uh, solo um, sticking, or we have pool sticking, which is uh, you know maybe for solo tech sticking, it's like one user depositing thirty two Ethereum and then uh, uh, gaining some, the return uh, just by himself or herself, and then uh, for Pooled staking is like a pool of user fund 32 Ethereum together uh, for a new node or for a new validator. So this is how this works. So what is the regulatory concern? So here we look at the table on the right hand side here. The very reason um, regulators hesitate about staking in ETF is very simple. Um, so first of all, staking is similar to a, um, interest or fixed income return because you, when you deposit 32 uh, ETH uh, into the um, uh, ETF potentially, and then you can earn around like three to eight uh, percent return. And this is like um, a, a fixed income securities. So, and by definition, securities has to be under further regulator scrutiny. So uh, this is the first concern of regulator. The second one is the liquidity risk. So um, since we have to lock up the uh, Ethereum for the uh, to, for guaranteeing the uh, so the network security and uh, stability, the such lockup period could in turn limit the liquidity of the uh, ETF itself. And then thirdly, the value of um, if, if Ethereum is subject to market volatility and uh, narrow condition, which could somewhat affect the overall staking return for uh, the user that enter the ETF through staking as well. And the last bit is that there is concentration risk because while we lock up the Ethereum, it can enhance security, network security, but it, it also creates single point of failure uh, given all this liquidity is stocked up. So um, this, these are the reason why uh, regulators hesitate about sticking uh, in the ETF as it is now a traditional uh, or mainstream financial asset. So uh, what are the way out uh, for the first concern on you know, ETH, ETH is uh, become some sort of like fixed income securities. That one is a little bit difficult to sort out because this is about, you know, how we get around the definition of securities. But for risk number two to number four, the liquidity risk, unstable return of staking and concentration risk, there is some way out. So first of all, the um, uh, the regulators could set a staking restriction that limits the amount or proportion the Ethereum stake by um, in a single uh, ETF. So this could mitigate some sort of uh, liquidity risk. And secondly, regulators may require the ETF managers to distribute the staking rewards like um, a fixed income payout uh, regularly or periodically. So this could also mitigate the liquidity and uh, concentration risk. And also this could ensure the stable return for staking. Um, so, if we, if the regulator regulatory hurdles can be removed, staking could potentially boost the um, e, uh, ETF price. But of course, this is subject to the market condition. So, if we can go to the next slide. So, in the immediate term, uh, if we have if if the, if the um, Sticking is approved in ETF in the immediate term. As more Ethereum is locked up in sticking, the circulating supply of uh, Ethereum could decrease, and that could potentially push up prices. So this is the first impact on supply. And then over the short term, the completion of uh, the competition for sticking reward could intensify, enhance 
uh, driven the uh, staking reward, which is at 3.3 to 8%, as we have mentioned earlier, which, which would be driven lower. So a lower yield would could also lower the demand for such ETF and ETH as well. But over the medium term, when um, the market participants get, uh, you know, uh, familiar with this sticking mechanism in the ETF, then uh, additional yield could still attract more institutional investors to join the party, and a significant influx of institutional capital into the um, Ethereum via the ETF could lead to an increase in liquidity and enhance the price as well. So, um, in the medium term, this could, it, um, I mean, in the medium term, it could help improve the liquidity and the um, pricing, but uh, of course, there will be a lot of uh, you know volatility uh, involved in the um, Ethereum staking in the, in the immediate term or in the short term after it is approved by the regulator. So this is we have this is something that we have to closely monitor. So this is the end for my part. Thank you, and then I will pass on to Nathan for his uh, updates on CBDC. All right. Uh, thank you, Samuel, and thank you, uh, Wei Liang, for the interesting update on. Crypto. Uh, regarding CBDC, there is also a lot of encouraging development recently. Uh, but before diving into the latest update from each country, let me quickly give you a broad overview of the big picture. So, based on a recent BIS report, almost every central bank they have surveyed is at least considering the idea. All right. Uh, some of them are testing wholesale CBDCs, while others are focused on retail versions. Uh, so, in general, the report suggests that in the next few years, uh, we are more likely to see wholesale CBDCs being rolled out more than uh, retail versions. All right. And um, when it comes to design features, uh, what the central banks are doing is that they are thinking about things like uh, making systems compatible, adding program uh, programmable features, and setting limits on how much people can hold, how much people can spend, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and uh, they are also working on boosting privacy. Uh, for instance, the ECB just released a report with details on how they are planning to ensure greater privacy for the uh, digital euro. Uh, we'll get into that in like five minutes, but first, let's talk about China, which is leading the way in this space. They have made uh, significant progress with their digital currency, the EZNY. All right. And um, if you have been keeping up with us, you probably know that the PBOC has been testing the EZNY or digital yuan for years. Right. And uh, recently they have just hit another milestone. Uh, so right now people in Hong Kong can get a uh, ECNY wallet, even without a mainland bank account. So as long as you have, as long as you are a Hong Kong resident and you got a phone number, you can open an ECNY wallet and pay merchants, shops, restaurants who accept the ECNY. And the latest development makes Hong Kong the first city outside of mainland China to join the pilot program. Okay. And uh, you can use it not just in Hong Kong, but across the greater Bay Area. You can you can you can use it in Shenzhen, you can use it in uh, Guangzhou, for instance, right? And you also can add money to your wallet right away through the fast payment system in Hong Kong. And I would say the timing is perfect given more and more people traveling between Hong Kong and the mainland. Right now, more and more people from Hong Kong spending their weekend in uh, Shenzhen, in, in Zhuhai, in Guangzhou, because prices over there are cheaper, uh, especially with the RMB being weak uh, against the Hong Kong dollar, right? And using the ECNY is super easy, uh, so it is very likely to catch on uh, pretty quickly. And right now, in terms of limit, there are still some limits, that is for sure. Uh, you can only use up to 2,000 RMB per transaction, uh, 10,000 RMB per day, and 50,000 RMB per year. 
but the but the uh, HKMA is working closely with the PBOC to expand the program. Uh, so this this could mean higher limits, uh, better IT verification, and smoother interactions between Hong Kong and mainland payment systems going forward. And aside from testing out the ECNY. Hong Kong is also working on its own digital version of the Hong Kong dollar uh, called the EHKD, digital Hong Kong dollar, right? So don't get the two mixed up. Uh, so in terms of the EHKD, in about October last year, the HAMA finished the first phase of experiments for the uh, digital Hong Kong dollar. Now they are sort of moving into phase two where they are digging deeper, deeper into the ideas from uh, phase one, like uh, customizable payments and uh, tokenizing assets through atomic transactions, right? And they are also checking out some new possibilities that they didn't explore in phase one. So basically, they are doing some refinement based on what they have learned so far. And meanwhile, the BIS has also teamed up with the uh, HAMA to launch another program and the focus of that program is on boosting privacy for uh, retail cbdc's uh, because bis have been consulting many users around the world right and the result is that it is very clear uh, that privacy is one of the major concerns when it comes to digital cash right a lot of people including you and me every one of us wants to keep control over our financial data when making uh, digital payments. So that is what they are doing. They are looking into new tech uh, 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 so the uh, technology can hide your identity by replacing your personal information with a random code uh, while, you know, they call it like a, a pseudonymization. And there's another technology which is called the zero knowledge proofs, which let you verify things without giving away uh, and the details. So that is what they're doing through all of this experiment. They're trying to see how, you know, this privacy boost could affect the system's performance and whether they meet regulatory standards. All right. And next slide, please. As far as other Asia country is concerned, uh, Thailand has recently wrapped up a test for a digital version of their currency, the Thai baht. Uh, so the Bank of Thailand teamed up with a couple of major Thai banks and a payments company for a trial involving about uh, 4,000 people and 140 merchants. And the results based on the BOT report, it showed that a digital bot could open the door to some new opportunities for innovation. But the central bank appears uh, it's not ready yet for a full rollout for a digital part. All right, they pointed out a few challenges, uh, such as non-bank participants having to pay fees to access it through uh, other banks and you know other middle banks, and there are also some issues with uh, getting digital payments to work smoothly online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in other words, there is still a lot of work to do before. Uh, the CBDC can be implemented in Thailand. Uh, but interestingly, the government over there is rolling out some digital money giveaway uh, because they have promised to do so in the election last year. But please bear in mind that uh, they're more like vouchers rather than a CBDC because those uh, giveaway come with, come with restrictions on where and when and who can use them. Okay, for instance, there are strict rules on what you can buy. You cannot buy uh, fuel using those uh, voucher. You cannot buy electronics. You cannot buy alcohol. You cannot buy tobacco, for instance, right? Okay, so uh, another thing is that the merchants cannot cash out the tokens right away. Uh, so what they got to do is that they have to hold onto them for several months before they can use them to pay, to pay other businesses. All right, so put it simply, these tokens do not fulfill, do not fully replace cash. So in other words, this is not a uh, CBDC, all right? 
And let's move on to uh, Euro Song. Let's move on to the digital Euro. And let's dive into a bit of its background. Here is the timeline, as you can see on the slide here. Uh, the ECB gave the green light in late 2023 to start a preparation phase to see whether uh, you know, creating a digital euro is doable. And this decision came after they began the initial investigation phase back in 2021. So right now, they're in the middle of that uh, preparation phase. You can see I've marked it with uh, little circles on the chart here. So during this phase, what they are doing is that they are working on finalizing the rule book that will set the guidelines for using the digital euro. And uh, they are also uh, going to select providers to develop the platform, uh, to develop the infrastructure needed. And they will be also doing more testing and diving deeper into the technical aspects, like making sure the digital euro works offline and developing the solid testing and rollout plan. So that is what they are doing in this phase. And by the time this phase wraps up in uh, 2025, the ECB will then decide whether to move forward with the digital euro. So there is no official answer yet for the time being. Okay. And the most latest development is that recently the ECB just put out a progress report where they laid out how they're making the digital euro more privacy focused than uh, current digital payment systems. Uh, they are talking about using things like random codes instead of personal identifiers. Uh, also, they are uh, hashing information, uh, uh, important information and encrypting transfers. And so all this tech stuff helps make sure payments cannot directly link back to the user. Okay, payment providers will only get the minimum personal data they need to follow the anti-money laundering rules. So it's kind of like how it works right now on other existing digital payment systems. And when you make offline payments, uh, whether it is sending money to a friend or buying something in a store, it stays strictly between, between you and the other person. No third parties snooping on your transaction details. All right, and in terms of devices, uh, next slide please, I have a chat here. Uh, they're looking at using like smartphones. Uh, they're also looking using like payment cards and other day, you know, other every tag, everyday tag to make offline use possible. All right. So what it means is that you could just bump phones with a friend to pay your share of a restaurant bill, for instance, or uh, maybe one of your maybe one of you uses a prepaid CPTC card instead of a phone and you know, or as you can see on this slide here, they have even floated the idea of uh, smart cards, a self-powered smart card on a chip that only need a quick connection when necessary. So pretty amazing that they're exploring all these different technologies. But anyway, the big thing, the main message here is that with the online version, uh, only you and the person you are paying have access to the transa uh, transaction information. Uh, there's going to be compliance checks only when you top up uh, your wallet or withdraw money from your wallet through your bank or uh, payment providers. Okay, so that is what they're exploring right now. And next slide, please. The last region that I uh, want to cover today is the Middle East. Uh, so one of the latest development is that the central bank of the UAE is gearing up to launch its own digital currency, uh, the digital dirham, okay? And so over the next 12 to 15 months, they are focusing on three main things. One of them is to roll out Ambridge project. This will kick off real CBDC transactions for international trade. Uh, so this is number one. Number two is proof of concept for bilateral CBDC trade with India because India is a major trading partner of the UAE, right? So they are doing a trial to see how it actually works. And number three is that they also gonna try the CBDC at home, uh, you know, testing how the digital Durham 
uh, could be used for both big financial transactions and everyday retail. Okay, uh, because in the UAE there is a major initiative going on called the Financial Infrastructure Transformation Program, which is set to wrap up by uh, 2026, and the digital Durham is a big part of this. Okay, so that's why the central bank over there is now encouraging all banks and uh, you know, financial institutions to hop on board with their uh, CBDC network. And aside from the UAE, Saudi Arabia has also joined Project Ambridge. For those who are not very familiar with uh, Project Ambridge, uh, the Project Ambridge is a multi-country project, uh, including China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the UAE. It kicked off in uh, 2021, focusing on testing how digital currencies can streamline, you know, fast and you know cross-border payments using blockchain technology. Okay, and yeah, so Saudi Arabia joined the Ambridge recently, and before the Ambridge, Saudi Arabia actually was already working with the UAE on another project, uh, which is also you know something to figure out how to make cross-border transaction smoother. Okay, so. So this is, you know, all of this development showing how seriously the Gulf nations are taking the potential of uh, digital currency currencies to uh, revolutionize trade. And in fact, based on a recent IMF report, about two thirds of the countries in the region, in the Middle East region, are exploring digital currencies as well. So not just Saudi Arabia, not just the UAE. All right, and the table on this slide that you are seeing here shows that for Gulf Corporation Council members and other oil exporters, one of the top priorities for them is to boost cross-border transaction efficiency by using the CBDC, right? And in other countries in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, many people actually do not have easy access to bank accounts. Uh, actually, I've got some charts on the next slide, please. The chart on the left shows how account ownership in the region is well below the global average. And the chart on the right breaks it down by country. Okay, so the main point here is that if CBDCs are able to offer a, uh, you know, at a lower cost than what's available right now, they could potentially increase competition in the payments market and help more people access bank accounts. and ultimately improving financial inclusion. So this is one of the goals here, all right? And uh, last but not least, the survey data didn't cover this, but in my opinion, uh, geopolitics is definitely playing a role in how these countries in the Middle East are thinking about and planning for digital currencies, all right? So uh, that's pretty much it from my side. Back to you. Right, thanks very much, Nathan. Um, so I think now will be a good time for everyone to um, drop your questions into the chat box uh, on the WebEx. So we'll be picking up some questions to answer um, from the audience in the next 10 minutes. Um, so let me just have a look at the chat and see what are the questions that we have. So um, the first question um, that I see is, well, actually there are a couple of questions with regards to CBDCs. Um, so uh, first question, what's the progress of CBDCs in the US? So I think that's directed to Nathan. And then sub there's also a, a subsequent question, will Singapore have a CBDC? So I think, uh, Nathan, uh, would you like to take those? Sure, uh, about in the US progress on retail CBDC uh, over there, uh, I would say it has hit a bit of a roadblock, especially compared to other G7 countries like uh, the UK and Japan and even those countries in Song that I just have uh, discussed. Uh, over there where things are moving ahead more quickly, I would say. Uh, but in the US, it is uh, not that smooth. It is. It has even become one of the subtopics in the 
uh, presidential campaign. For instance, Harris is sort of supporting a CBDC, uh, seeing it as a way to boost financial inclusion and give the Federal Reserve a better shot at reaching people who are often left out. So again, it is about financial inclusion, right? Uh, uh, so I would say if she wins uh, the election, she's likely to push for it and work with the Congress and regulators to make it happen. But on the flip side, uh, on the contrary, Donald Trump is strongly against the idea, seeing it as a threat to personal freedom and a tool for government control. I mean, so we have two very extreme uh, cases here, and the development going forward will be very much hinge on the fact that who's going to be the next president of the United States. And regarding Singapore, uh, the progress is also encouraging. Uh, they have uh, issued report about the uh, uh, trials. But again, uh, I, I, I think that a real CBDC uh, to roll out in the near term is not very likely because there's still a lot of research to do. Right, right. So I, I, I think um, I'm with you in terms of the U.S. facing some um, degree of resistance. I think the Fed has also said that uh, that they will be moving more slowly and observing what other central banks do because the dollar being a key global reserve currencies, uh, there's definitely uh, a need to be more circumspect about the risk from introducing CBDCs and so on. With regards to banking system liquidity, with regards to the um, potentially introducing some unknowns uh, to the financial uh, system. Uh, for the case of Singapore, I think uh, we we don't have a CBDC, but the government has been giving CDC vouchers for people to spend um, in food courts and supermarkets and so on and so forth. So, so to, to some extent, there's some kind of data and trials on, uh, ongoing in terms of gov the government's uh, trying to direct spending and seeing what the impact is um, in terms of injecting spending that's, uh, into the economy. So that's quite similar to what the Bank of Thailand Thailand has been doing on the um, digital uh, payments front in terms of providing direct cash, not necessarily cash, but direct spending power to consumers. All right. So yeah. um, second question um, is, I guess, on ITER. Uh, for Samuel, so um, you mentioned that um, the change in staking could have some impact on the short term, intermediate term, mid uh, long term. So, how will you define uh, these terms, uh, time periods for this? Um, yeah, thank you, Wei So, I think, well, of course, we we do not have a very definite immediate short term or long term definition here, given the evolving uh, market environment and for cryptocurrency, it can just move much faster than the traditional asset classes. But if I have to make an assumption here, I would probably define the immediate term by the first few days or first week of the announcement. So if we could record the chart from Wei Lang uh, on BTC, BTC reacts very fast on the first few days uh, due, to, uh, due to the SEO and it starts to stabilize towards the end of the week. So I assume ETH would probably react in the same way. Um, for the short term, that could be after the first week, which is the from second week onward, when the market starts to stabilize and, uh, you know, digesting the news. And in fact, if we look at the Ethereum to BTC ratio, it started to ease quite soon. For example, if we look at the ETH, ETF approval announcement, it started to ease quite soon after the, uh, the approval announcement was out. So uh, for the medium term, here is like the long term in the financial markets. So the better liquidity condition will drive higher price and in, and also price stability for the asset class in the longer term. So this would be a, how I define the uh, the short or medium, immediate or the, uh, medium term. Right. So um, with the prospect of staking, will ETH uh, likely go out in value? I think um, as as Sam mentioned, a slide in the longer term it, it could. Uh, potentially do so. Um, so the next question is, um, I guess we have a question on the ECNY. What is the impact on banks from the ECNY rollout? Uh, so Nathan, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, I think the main impact of ECNY on bank is mainly on bookkeeping. All right, uh, because the banks in China, what they need to do is that they need to keep digital cash separate from 
uh, regular savings because it represents money that is actually in circulations, right? Not the demand deposits uh, or what we call M1, which banks used to lend out again to companies and households, right? So the ECNY or digi the digital yuan is M0, meaning uh, before commercial banks can distribute digital yuan to retail users, they have to deposit 100% of its value as reserves at the central bank. So this means there is no multiply effect. So uh, we, we got to uh, be very clear of the definition here. So the main impact is going to be on bookkeeping. And so the overall impact will be very, very minimal. And another reason why this, you know, the impact would be minimal is that the PBOC right now is taking a two tier approach, uh, you know, by launching the CBDC instead of a one tier uh, model. And the reason is that if they are doing it under a one tier model, the PBOC would be issuing the CBDC directly to the public, right? And if that is the case, then we might be seeing some consequences because CBDC is issued by the uh, central bank, right? It's a fiat money. So it has higher degree of credibility compared to, uh, uh, you know, other like uh, Alipay and, you know, uh, WeChat Pay, right? So meaning commercial banks could be crowded out from the retail market. So banks would have to, uh, you know, they may have to go to the in the market, in the bank market for, uh, uh, borrowing to borrow money. Okay, so that might increase cost of funding, which might in turn lead to, uh, in some extreme case, lead to this intermediate uh, intermediation and you know dampen economic activities. So that's why uh, they want to do it via a two tier structure in uh, uh, instead of one tier st uh, structure to avoid this sort of this intermediation, right? Uh, yeah, so that's the difference. Right. Um, so I agree with you uh, that, that risk uh, with regards to this intermediation, uh, there are certainly something to be aware of. I think um, we're running out of time, but we have managed to um, have Timer join us on a call. Um, so would, would, would you like to um, close off the call, Timer, with uh, some comments? Uh, well, first of all, apologies. Uh, there were some other uh, things to attend. Uh, I'm glad that you know we got a good showing and a good set of questions. Uh, just if I may squeeze in, Nathan, uh, I was actually at a conversation earlier where we were looking at the Hong Kong economy and the capital outflows that has been a feature of their economy recently. Any sign that Hong Kong dollar is turning into cryptos or some of it? Uh, there is some unofficial numbers showing there are uh, more inflow to uh, crypto from the Hong Kong dollar. Uh, but the outflow is also due to the uh, interest rate spread. So not solely because of crypto. Right. So Hong Kong dollar, the high bar is 60, 70 basis points lower than the US dollar so far rate. So I think that also has been a bit of a carry trade, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think, William, we should probably wrap it up. It's five o'clock. Right, right. So, um, so, so thanks everyone. I think we have uh, um, shared our outlook in terms of um, the various drivers in crypto markets. We've seen quite meaningful shifts, uh, not just on the supply factors, but also giving more confidence to uh, institutional investors that the Bitcoin market has matured, uh, is able to handle uh, various uh, supply shocks. Uh, we have also been been seeing very solid progress on the CBDCs not just in China, but also across um, uh, global central banks as well. So thank you everyone for uh, attending our update and um, we'll be happy to address further questions via email uh, if, you, if you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.